Welcome once again to another news roundup, the first news roundup of 2021. Uh, and I, as ever, I'm happy to be joined with Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Hello, Julia. Happy New Year. Thank you, Dave. Happy New Year to you, too. I'm happy to be back with the Somerville Media Center. I know. It's been a while. <laughs> um, and as ever, news is rapidly changing um, on all sorts of scales from international to national to local. We're focusing on hyper-local news, um, and that starts with uh, some COVID-19 news. Um, so what do you what do you have for us, Julia? Absolutely. I love that. Yes, we are needed at the local level. So let's start there. Um, so I think um, many people, if you've been watching these, if you're just kind of tuned into the city's COVID response, you'll know about some of these resources. But um, I'm always taking a look at Somerville's website at somervillema.gov slash COVID-19. And right on there, there's a, a link to a great uh, data dashboard. So um, if we're just going to take a look at that really quick, um, you can see that we're actually uh, hitting some all-time highs. Um, in terms of the number of people testing positive. Yeah, so you can see um, we are having more confirmed cases. Our percent positivity is going up. Um, right now, you can see that total positive case number um, almost, almost at 4,000. Um, we just had another fatality bringing us to 54 fatalities um, since this hit. Um, so if you scroll down a little bit, you can see this kind of visually represented in the graph um, right here, because you know it's 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 so odd when I look at things like this that you know we think everything was you know so so bad right back in April we have these memories of being like quarantined and locked up in our houses and um, here we are and you know now that looks like a little blip <laughs> yeah. on yeah. kind of on the graph compared to where we are now so um, when you take a look at this you can clearly see um, that you know things are a, li a little tough. Um, the last kind of week or so, we've had some kind of all time high in terms of people who have, test posit have tested positive in a day. Um, this does mean though that people are getting tested, which is a good thing. Um, if you continue scrolling down just a little bit, this page is full of kind of different ways to look at this data. Um, this is kind of another representation um, of those case counts, that line of kind of red and green arrows represents um, kind of how we're moving. It's just another way to continue scrolling down a little bit. Um, again, this one's just, you know, going to keep going up. This is just the cumulative positive cases. Yeah. Um, if you scroll down a little bit more, this I think is interesting and kind of represents where we were at in the spring versus where we're at now. Yeah. Um, so one thing, of course, to keep in mind is that our testing capability in the spring was not nearly as high or organized as it is now. So, but also, I mean, for, for a number of reasons, this is more widespread. You know, it's been around longer. Um, society right now is more open than it was um, in kind of that April, May period, which is why those numbers kind of went, went down in July. That was such a low, a low month, which is great, um, but have really jumped up in December. Um, and, you know, based on this trajectory, you know, it is January 12th as we're recording this. and this already represents that we've had 440 cases already in January. So that's, you know, we're kind of on a path to really probably surpass um, December numbers. Um, if you continue going down, there is one um, kind of new feature of this dashboard a little bit further that I wanted to highlight, um, which is kind of this area. So zip code. And if you scroll a little bit more down, um, the city has represented these um, maps. And beforehand, they had the zip code reference map and the heat map. Um, but this 2010 environmental justice populations map is a new addition. And I just want to draw people's attention to it because um, a few months ago, the journal did some reporting on this because when I looked at the heat map, I was like, wow, that looks kind of like East Somerville and public housing and represented, you know, up in Ward 7. And um, I just wanted to kind of look into like who who is being you know impacted by this and um essentially by representing this um this new map this 2010 environmental justice populations they're showing us quite clearly that um this virus is impacting vulnerable populations at a higher rate mm. um so it's it's quite clear i mean if you look at like the minority population income minority income you can and then just cross it right over with that heat map it's very, very clear, <laughs> the correspondence. Um, so I think, you know, I just draw, wanted to draw people's attention to this because I think, you know, as we move forward in conversations around school reopening, 
different kind of reopening different aspects of society that, um, you know, equity and um, equity is a really important perspective for all of us to have just in terms of thinking about like who, who is suffering the most, you know what I mean? And how can we center them kind of in these conversations, yeah. um, which our, our municipal leaders already, you know, are doing, of course. Um, but I think it's an interesting new feature. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, it's interesting. I saw, I saw an update as I was like doing my my doom scrolling and mm -hmm. and seeing uh, that the incoming head of the CDC under the Biden administration that that's going to be a focus of the new of the CDC leadership is uh, you know where the neighborhoods across the country where the virus is really having an impact and you know as as we're seeing in in heat maps it is in concentrated areas where people of color are living and black and brown populations so that the CDC is going to be focusing on this and making it uh, a, a, a focus of, of their fight um, is, is kind of uh, heartening uh, to hear that, um, that, that, that that focus is going to be there on a national level. Absolutely. I didn't read that yet, but thank you so much for sharing that. And I think um, this is kind of relevant. We're going to talk a little bit about school reopening in this roundup today. Um, and um, that has been a, a kind of a central aspect of discussion in, in those kind of meetings as well, that um, a lot of school committee members have been looking to New York and the way that, you know, when those school reopenings happened, a lot of um, schools essentially kind of became segregated again. There have been some incredible reporting coming out of New York showing that um, black and brown families who have been much more impacted were also keeping their students home because of that, whether it was losing family members, whether it was a fear or lack of trust in the system to keep their children or family safe. Um, there are a number of ways that this kind of information is relevant in these larger discussions. But we can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so just kind of like a little bit more about the virus. Um, obviously, people right now are thinking a lot about vaccination, right? There's been this whole kind of statewide conversation and it's begun. So, you know, most of us here, people aren't going to be, it's not really going to be a reality for us for a while. However, um, our own kind of city first responders have already begun getting vaccinated. Um, so CHA, sorry, Cambridge Health Alliance employees have, um, began getting vaccinated in December. That is continuing. And the city announced last week um, that vaccination would begin for some um, for, uh, first responders, 911, police and fire staff. Um, they had got uh, 500 doses of the vaccine and that began on January 11th. So even though like, I'll just speak for myself, this still feels kind of far away for me, right? I'm just kind of part of the general population. I'm relatively young, so I'm not going to be a priority for a while. Um, yet, you know, people in my community are being vaccinated. So I think that's kind of a cool thing to keep in mind that like, even though this feels really far away for some of us, like more people are get becoming safe to this and are less likely to spread it like as we speak you know what i mean with every day that passes so i feel heartened by that i'll just say that um and kind of beyond that um i think most people know that you know free testing still continues in assembly square um somerville continues to limit um certain kind of uh, business reopenings we're still in that kind of rollback of phase two there are still capacity restrictions um so yeah, I think you know most people are relatively familiar with where things are at, and I think, yeah, that's a pretty good update. <laughs> and I just want to make sure that our viewers know, as ever, as as they have been able to do since uh, since March, to be able to go to SomervilleMA.gov uh, uh, to get access to that information, and also information about uh, testing, uh, how to sign up for testing at uh, the Assembly Square site. Uh, and any other testing availability, av excuse me, testing availability that uh, may be available to uh, certain segments of the population within Somerville. Um, and also uh, mass.gov is a good resource. Um, those are, that covers statewide data, kind of the latest information from the governor um, and all that sort of information. So good resources. For Absolutely, thank you for sharing those. Uh, moving on to some other news, um, you know, you did touch on school reopenings sure, and yeah. how the city is exploring uh, what to do about that. Um, what do you know, Julia? Sure. Um, so I've been covering this um, for a while. I mean, this schools have been closed in Somerville. Um, in-person instruction has been closed since since March. Um, so this, you know, this is a has been an, an issue, an ongoing discussion 
since then, you know, for, for months. Um, but especially I think in the past few months, it's grown a little bit more urgent. Um, it's now January. Um, we're kind of facing down March, which will be, you know, a year without students in classrooms. And, you know, there's, you know, passions are running high, you know, as, as they say, um, understandably, this is, you know, a really, really tough issue. Um, and there's a lot to consider here. So um, I'll just kind of speak on the most recent developments, um, because I will say that information changes rapidly. Um, Somerville is uh, undergoing a, a number of kind of, well, they're, they're taking on a number of mitigation measures in order to make schools safe once they reopen. So some of that is just stocking up on PPE. It's been creating testing partnerships and signing up for things with Tufts with the Broad Institute. Um, but it's also very costly improvements to our HVAC systems across a number of schools. It's ordering portable filters to put in specific rooms. It's, um, you know, there are all these different measures that Somerville is undertaking. And then Besides that, and you know, within that, um, conversations with educators and families about how to do this. Um, so I think right now the biggest kind of debate is around metrics and thresholds, um, because the Somerville Educators Union, which represents um, Somerville's teachers um, and paraprofessionals, um, has been saying, you know, we are not comfortable returning to in-person instruction until the district has established specific and definitive thresholds for when to close or reopen schools. Um, and they haven't, negotiation is ongoing and the parties have not come to an agreement quite yet. Um, and kind of what's happened leading up to this is that, you know, there have been a number of meetings um, at school committee meetings and city meetings about this. Um, the mayor has presented a lot of research. Um, he has also put together an advisory group, um, including parents, experts, and other staff members that are um, supposed to advise him on these decisions. Um, the school committee meeting has heard from experts in infectious disease and epidemiology. Um, there's been all this kind of knowledge gathering, right? And kind of trying to get the right information. And yet um, it's still been really difficult for these you kind of the city and these educators to like decide on or agree um, to specific thresholds. I think, I think it's beginning to happen. Um, they're starting to narrow in on what metrics really count. Um, you know, for example, there was um, when they heard from experts last week, um, you know, the school committee asked point blank, like, what would you pick? You know what I mean? If you were going to pick a metric to drive this, what would you pick? And one of them said, you know, like, I think the percentage of like contacts being, you know, who are testing positive. So if one person tests positive, what percentage of contacts are tested and what percentage of, percentage of those are test positive, you know, as a matter of like testing or um, testing capability and also how much is this virus spreading um, and are we catching it? You know what I mean? Yeah. So they're kind of, they're starting to find these numbers, but those same experts also said that it's really challenging to pick like one, one number, one thing in which to kind of, that would definitively say, this is when we need to close schools. Um, because there's in-school transmission, there's community transmission, they're related, they're not the same. You know, adults are much more at risk of serious COVID symptoms than children, but children can still get infected and spread the virus to family members. I, I hear myself talking, it's, there's so many things <laughs> to right. consider, right? And not to mention the, the, um, this new strain that acts in different ways than the, than the COVID uh, um, strain that we've, we've been used to. So, you know, that I'm sure that's, a, that's on the forefront of parents and teachers and all the people that make decisions like this. So as, as, the, um, as the city looks towards setting reopening standards and policies, uh, is there any sort of like model that they're looking at um, or models? Um, you, before we, we came on, you mentioned um, that there was a lot of really good reporting coming out of New York. And so like, is that where the city leaders are looking to is like the New York school system? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think that um, I know one that has absolutely been a discussion. And I think that unfortunately, um, you know, every district is approaching this in different ways, but right now it's kind of part of that controversy that 
I don't think many districts, I don't know of any districts right now in Massachusetts who have set specific thresholds. Um, Cambridge had voted to set specific thresholds, but actually last week voted to consider them um, informative rather than definitive and changed their own policy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also kind of a matter of controversy that there isn't really something to strive towards that Somerville in kind of taking on this approach is doing something new. Yeah. Um, and I don't, you know, I am absolutely not an expert or extremely well versed in what is happening in the New York public system, but kind of the way that um, that has been referenced in school committee meetings has more to do with equity. Um, at the school committee meeting, um, as we're speaking last night on, on January 11th, um, chair, new chair Andre Green um, shared that, you know, the only thing that he feels would be like even more of a failure than like never returning to remote instruction would be to return to in-person instruction with a segregated district, um, which is what a lot of people have said has happened in New York and in certain parts of New York. Right. Um, so he said like, you know, we have to be kind of, you know, centering the right people. We have to be making sure um, that we do, you know, whatever our plan ends up being, that people trust it. And, and that people believe, you know what I mean, because we have told them and have been clear with them and that we understand ourselves that the schools are safe, that their children will not, will not get COVID or, you know, if they do that, we are going to take every measure, you know what I mean, to protect them and protect families. Um, but really, I think what's, what the, the driver of the plan in Somerville is that they are trying to prevent any COVID transmission in schools. They acknowledge that COVID will enter schools because there is community transmission, but what they're attempting to do with the testing, with the masking, with social distancing, with you know all of these different measures is make sure that it's not spread in schools. And that is, I think that is, um, why, like they're saying, well, that's enough. You know what I mean? Like if we can say that there will be no transmission in schools and like this should be enough, why does there need to be a threshold? And I think I was speaking with the SEU president earlier today and he was saying, well, that's really great. But at the same time, there may be a case in which community transition levels reach such that staffing buildings becomes difficult. You know, a number of, if teachers are, are sick, whole units have to go remote anyways if if more and more classes are having to be quarantined because there's so much community transmission coming into the schools even if it's not transmission in the schools so there's a whole lot to consider here it's it's very complex and i'm you know i've i understand this much just because of how many hours of meetings i've listened to um but i think you know it's a really it's really important and you know when i say like you know the seu has a point so do parents you know, this is taking a, a toll on students, especially high needs students, ELL students, special education students who have been home without these supports for months. You know, diagnoses of mental health issues are up. Um, incidences of, you know, abuse are up because children are home and don't are, aren't able to leave the house. Like there are very, you know, important, you know, urgent reasons why we should be getting our students back to school. There are also important reasons we need to be making sure that our educators don't die. <laughs> when they return to school for yeah. this job. So it's it's a really hard issue that, you know, there's a lot here. Um, and, you know, this, we've been following it as it comes. This is where it stands now, but yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. And again, circling back to what I touched on is um, that having a new, having new federal leadership um, just kind of paves the way for all setting the conditions right for school reopenings and for cities and for school districts to confidently lay, lay plans. Um, where we are now here on January 12th, uh, you know, I was, I was looking at um, a CNN headline that had reported that the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, just reported that we're not going to achieve herd immunity this year, just with the, the, the way that trends are going. So, you know, I'm sure our city leadership um, and the school committee and school, school committees across the nation look at that and say, how do we plan in the face of, you know, kn knowing that, um, that that's not going to be achievable this year and, and looking at other statistics and important things that they are looking at. And, 
you know, how do you, how do you, are we at a point uh, where we can do in-person learning? Um, it, will it be achievable that this year in some version? So a lot of, a lot of really hard questions as ever with this pandemic, um, you know, just trying to get something like school back up and running in-person learning. Um, whew, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> um, so to wrap up, we, uh, there's, there's another uh, item that you, you listed here that that's, on the forefront of, of your reporting, of your diligent and awesome reporting for the Somerville Journal, um, <laughs> is the uh, eviction diversion letter um, and how general housing support uh, coming from city leaders. Uh, what did you find out about that, Julie? Sure, um, so I wanted to highlight this just because um, I think housing, housing justice and housing work um, is kind of at the forefront of a lot of people's minds lately. Obviously with this pandemic, a lot of people are having a hard time paying rent. You know, the city has allocated millions to rental assistance, which has been distributed to agencies across Somerville, as well as allocated through the city itself. So this, this kind of issue of, of just housing, you know what I mean, is, is really um, personal, you know, to, to a lot of people. Um, so I wanted to just highlight this, this kind of one, one piece of it um, is there was a, a recent statewide campaign um, to, you know, ask landlords to sign an eviction diversion letter. Um, and what this is, is it's, it's not a binding ag agreement, you know, by, by any, you know, chance it's, it's just, um, it's a letter kind of of intent, a letter of commitment to, um, that doesn't say I will never evict. It says like in the case of a non-payment like incidents that I commit as a landlord to working with my tenants through rental support applications, um, whether it's also commits to abiding by the federal eviction moratorium, um, proactively engaging with their residents to, you know, create payment plans, um, basically kind of just engaging, engaging with residents and tenants, you know, engaging in mediation, if that is what's necessary, but just kind of committing to try, in this case, to keep people housed, mm -hmm. acknowledging that there are a number of reasons right now why someone might not be able to pay their rent, but also acknowledging that there are a lot of resources out there right now because so many people can't pay their rent. Um, so it's kind of this, this commitment to, to do that. So um, I spoke with um, a, a resident around here who kind of worked with the Somerville Office of Housing Stability on a, a, a rent kind of assistance application. Um, he said it went really well um, and he was kind of really kind of praising the whole process. He said it was, you know, it's really complicated, but they walked me through the whole thing. And um, I spoke with his landlord as well, who had a really, um, a really interesting perspective, I thought, which was, um, you know, he said um, that he, you know, he is really kind of understanding of, you know, the hard times that his tenants are going through. He said, you know, I believe in karma and like, why wouldn't I help my tenants if it's going to help me, you know, because also in the situations like the tenants are needing to pay their rent, the landlord wants the rent, you know, <laughs> so, so working with their tenants to get this rental assistance serves everyone. Um, but at the same time, I thought it was interesting that this landlord was also rather hesitant to sign the letter himself because he was afraid, you know, because it's still, you know, even though it's not a binding legal kind of contract, he still felt, you know, that he was signing his name to something. And even though, you know, my impression was that that was his attitude already. Um, I think he was still a little bit like, well, like, what if I sign it and something really awful happens and then I'm have to go back to my word. Um, but I thought that was an interesting kind of case um, yeah. that Somerville is kind of really trying to get landlords to do, to do this. And right now, a lot of nonprofit landlords think like Somerville Community Corporation have already signed this. Um, some private landlords, but not quite as many. So um, I think, you know, it's an interesting effort. Um, but when I was speaking with um, a caseworker at the Office of Housing Stability, you know, it's about it's about getting this commitment from landlords. Of course, it's great, you know, if landlords will commit to doing this work. But he was saying that also, you know, it's really about just getting the word out that like these resources are available to tenants, but to landlords so that if a tenant can't pay their rent and maybe they don't know, their landlord might be able to be like, hey, I know about this thing. Like, I'm happy to work through this application with you so that, you know, you can stay, you're a great tenant and like, I will get the rent, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's just kind of another, another example of the, the different kinds of like housing security work that Somerville is doing right now, yeah. which is pretty cool. Yeah. It sounds like a good outreach effort that is asking that, you know, landlords be a little more active in yeah. 
in in the eviction process um you know which you know you could they they should be <laughs> if they're bothering to evict somebody so you know if if they're uh if attention is being drawn to resources that they could point their tenants to uh and there's just more awareness all around it for tenants um uh, tenants rights and landlords um especially especially now it sounds great yeah i agree cool <laughs> well th thanks julia uh this was this was a good uh wrap up to kick off 2021 Woo! yeah here we go oh my here goodness go. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i really have nothing else to say to here we go except no right it's it's like we're like 10 days in and so many things have already happened we've got yeah. what inauguration in another 10 days so Woo! a lot of things to look forward to in the year there's a lot of work uh, to be done, a lot of steps that need to happen. Um, and we'll be here for all of it. Uh, I'm Dave well, Ortega. <laughs> I'm Dave Ortega from Somerville Media Center. And this is, and uh, I was joined with Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. You can check out Somerville Journal at somerville.wickedlocal.com. Is that it? Awesome. Did it. And, uh, <laughs> and Somerville Media Center at somervillemedia.org. Um, Thank you.